I was wondering how comfortable you would feel in an airplane the moment just before landing, realizing that the landing lane lights are not working and the air traffic controller is not at all trained for the job. Well, the same applies to ships. They also need external systems, for example, buoys, lighthouses, leading lines, vessel traffic services for safe and efficient navigation. Do you know what an aid to navigation is? Uh, an aid to navigation? An aid to navigation? Yes. To navigate on the universe? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, universe, you know, uh, with oh, the stars. the universe, you're thinking big. To help old people with navigation. And if you need to find your way to get to a port. Then I have my cards, my maps. And uh, lights for, uh, for, to, uh, to make sure that the traffic goes in one direction. Yeah, leading lines. Leading lines. Exactly. Yeah. Look, that's an aid to navigation. A lighthouse. Oh. Look, the boy over there. And this light is an aid to navigation to help ships. Ah, good to know. Thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, bye bye. We are responsible as a vessel traffic service operator in this area um, to guiding the vessels from direction to their uh, berth. Do you know what we celebrate the 1st of July? The 1st of July? No, no idea. I think IALA is uh, 50 years or 100 years. Or... The 1st of July. World Marine Aids to Navigation Day is a tribute to the people and the organizations working in aids to navigation. So, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. you very much. Yeah. An aid to navigation. Yeah. yeah. Good. An aid to navigation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sure. Perfect. Welcome. Welcome everyone to this special webinar organized today in celebration of the World Marine Aids to Navigation Day. We have a very exciting program with a combination of presentations and videos from different parts of the world. As this webinar is organized through Microsoft Teams, may I kindly remind everyone to keep their cameras off and mute their microphones when they're not speaking. We will not be answering questions during the webinar, but you're welcome to post comments in the chat or stay with us at the end for a little chat. Uh, we will now start with an introduction from Francis Zakaria, IR Secretary General. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it is a great privilege to welcome you to this, the third in the series of highly successful World Marine Aids Navigation Day commemorations following the good work initiated in Palma de Mallorca in Spain in 2019 and repeated virtually around the globe last year and this year. In 2018, the General Assembly of Ayala decided to establish the World Marine Aids Navigation Day to be commemorated on the 1st of July each year the date of the creation of Ayala in 1957. We retain the, the same well-remembered theme from the earlier commemorations, marine age navigation, successful voyages, sustainable planning. The principal objective of this day is to promote greater awareness of Ayala and its work by bringing to the attention of the wider public the role of marine age navigation and the significance of ILS technical work in enhancing the safety of navigation and protection of the marine environment worldwide. In this very short address, I would, I would like to pay tribute to the efforts of the members of ILS during the time, during the very difficult time of the COVID confinement. They have continued providing ACE navigation so essential for the safety of marine navigation and the continuous flow of food, fuel and medical supplies, along with many other commodities upon which we all depend daily. Staff of our members were and still are 
required to attend their normal workplace during the essential nature of their work when responding to outages and performing vital maintenance to keep their service of marine ace navigation operational. This devotion deserves special mention at a day like this. I look forward to today's program with many interesting speakers and also the celebration of the Lighthouse of the Year, carefully selected by the Engineering Committee's Heritage Working Group and approved by the Council. The group had 29 nominations and shortlisted three lighthouses. The Lizard Lighthouse in England, Palmido Lighthouse in Korea and the Cape Byron Lighthouse in Australia. Finally, Cape Byron Lighthouse was chosen as the Lighthouse of the Year. On behalf of the Council, the Secretariat and our worldwide membership, I send our good wishes for a successful event in the hope that the peoples of the world come to know and appreciate the work of IALA and the highly professional staff of its members. Finally, I have to thank all of you for your kind collaboration and support with respect to the World Marine Ace Navigation Day. And I really look forward to seeing the pictures from around the world of today's unique celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Uh, we will now proceed with the presentations. The first one was sent uh, to us from Chile. It is a video from Valeria Leon, who is an uh, alumni of the Worldwide Academy. Let's see. Soy la Teniente Segundo Litoral, Señalización Marítima, Valeria Leon Maturana. Actualmente me encuentro en el sur de nuestro país, en Punta Arenas, como jefa del Centro Zonal más grande de Chile. A nivel nacional tenemos 1.286 señales, de las cuales 647 corresponden a nuestra jurisdicción, compuesto por sistemas de balizas, boyas, ayudas electrónicas y faros que permiten al navegante conocer su posición, ubicar peligros y trazar su ruta. Como jefa del Centro Zonal, tengo 41 personas a cargo que cumplen diferentes funciones como aislamiento en faros, en zonas recónditas del territorio suramericano, control administrativo de señales, lo cual involucra flujo de tareas, control de procesos y funcionamiento y operatividad de las señales, inventario de los diferentes equipos e implementos necesarios para esta tarea, mantenimiento de tercer nivel, lo cual involucra trabajos en zonas aisladas y difíciles condiciones meteorológicas, capacitación a nuestras tecnologías como lo son sistemas satelitales y de energías renovables, aprovisionamiento a faros aislados, los cuales se hace en coordinación con unidades navales en lugares de difícil acceso, control financiero y adquisición fundamentales para mantener la eficiencia y transparencia de procesos. Cabe destacar que tenemos en nuestra jurisdicción siete faros aislados, Radio Estación Marítima Isla San Pedro, Faro Evangelista, Faro Fergüey, Radio Estación Marítima Bahía Félix, Faro Punta Dúngenes, Faro Cabo Espíritu Santo, Faro Islas Diego Ramírez. La región de Magallanes y Antártica Chilena se caracteriza por canales y rutas de navegación accidentadas, de difícil acceso y complejas condiciones meteorológicas las cuales hacen necesario el óptimo funcionamiento de las ayudas a la navegación, en donde el capital humano mantiene constante preparación y un alto grado de alistamiento operacional. En este Día Internacional de las Ayudas a la Navegación, quiero enviar un afectuoso saludo a todas las autoridades de faros del mundo y agradecer a la Asociación Internacional de Ayudas Marinas a la Navegación y Autoridades de Faros, y a la y a la Organización Marítima Internacional, OMI, por darme la oportunidad de participar en el año 2019 en un seminario impartido por la IALA en Cartagena de India, Colombia, además de tener la oportunidad este año de participar en los diferentes comités que profesionalmente me han contribuido a mi gestión al utilizar las diversas recomendaciones IALA. Chile ha estado presente como miembro del Consejo de la IALA en donde ha participado activamente colaborando con otros estados, asumiendo una responsabilidad llena de desafíos y que quiere perpetuar en el tiempo. 
lo cual también reafirma su cooperación internacional en otras instancias como lo es en la OMI y su actual postulación al Consejo. En este contexto importante, recordar y destacar la importancia de la señalización marítima a nivel internacional y es de esta manera que en la actualidad, en un mundo globalizado, las rutas marítimas han pasado a ser protagonistas en el intercambio comercial en el que se ha incrementado en forma exponencial poniendo grandes desafíos a los países. El Estado de Chile, a través de la Armada, ha mantenido siempre una presencia importante en el quehacer nacional, no solo en la defensa, sino que también en el ámbito marítimo, ejerciendo parte de sus capacidades en la vigilancia oceánica y una constante preocupación por contar con una extensa red de ayuda a la navegación. Hoy, nuestro país efectúa la administración marítima a través de una gran estructura organizacional amparada en su marco legal nacional, en donde se establece como máxima autoridad la Dirección General del Territorio Marítimo y Marina Mercante y recayendo inmediatamente su continuidad en las gobernaciones marítimas y las capitanías de puerto. Una de las funciones principales de la Armada de Chile es velar por la seguridad de la navegación marítima, fluvial y lacustre, teniendo en cuenta que nuestro país posee un extenso litoral, que tiene incorporado en sus costas y bajos fondos una importante red de ayuda a la navegación, como lo es la señalización marítima, la que apoya y brinda seguridad a la navegación a todas las embarcaciones mayores y menores que navegan en el territorio nacional. Bajo este concepto, Chile acepta las recomendaciones entregadas por la Asociación Internacional de Ayudas Marinas a la Navegación y Autoridades de Faros y ALA. La señalización marítima comprende una red de ayudas a la navegación compuesto por un sistema de balizas, boyas y faros que permiten al navegante conocer su posición, ubicar peligros y trazar una ruta segura hasta su destino. En la actualidad, Chile cuenta con más de 1.286 señalizaciones marítimas a lo largo de su costa, las que para su instalación conlleva la realización de estudios tendientes a buscar los puntos a señalar tomando en cuenta necesidades de los usuarios y la sugerencia del servicio hidrográfico y oceanográfico de la Armada y posteriormente personal especializado de la institución sea el encargado de instalar y mantener la ascensión marítima. Es por esto que cabe destacar la importancia que tiene la señalización marítima tanto a nivel nacional como internacional. Chile es un país marítimo por excelencia que depende del comercio marítimo, por lo que no contar con una red de ayudas a la navegación afectaría nuestro intercambio internacional y a la seguridad en la navegación, pues su existencia permite tener una navegación segura y expedita en las naves nacionales e internacionales y contribuyendo directamente a la seguridad de la vida humana en el mar, solas y al cuidado del medio ambiente previniendo la contaminación por buques, marpol evitando accidentes que puedan provocar la pérdida de vidas humanas y contaminaciones irreparables por hidrocarburos derramados o cargas peligrosas a los océanos, entre otros. Estos antecedentes son fundamentales para comprender procesos mayores y trascendentales, siendo una instancia de reflexión en este importante día. Desde Chile les deseamos a todos un feliz día de las ayudas a la navegación. Thank you very much, Chile, for this excellent video. Thank you. Um, the second presentation now is uh, that we will see is from Director Sido Sheikh Ali Noor and Abdi Hamid Ali Abdi Haman from Somalia, also alumni of the Worldwide Academy. Their participation was gathered into one video with an introduction from Director Sido and a presentation from Abdi Hamid. Yes, I, uh, Mr. Sido Sheikh Ali Noor, the Director of the Technical and Marine Dep uh, Lighthouse Department of Ministry of Ports and Marine Transport of the Federal Government of Somalia, share 
Worldwide Academy of Ayala in aids to navigation authorities, master mariners, seafarers, ship builders, ship owners, charters, ship managers, ship brokers, shipping agents, cargo receivers, and any other stockholder, the congratulation of the Brin 80s to Navigation Day, which is today, 1st of July. I hope all of them safe voyage, economic, efficient movement of vessels for the benefit of the marine community and the protection of the environment. So I appreciate and say all of them safe voyage and stay you and your family safe for the next day for, 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 for the next day. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Hi, hello, my name is Abdi Hamid Ali, uh, head of uh, Marine Communications and Traffic Services of Ministry of Ports and Marine Transport. And in making use of uh, to this occasion of World Aton's Day, I want to take advantage of it by highlighting my experience of the work I do in line with the capacity building that I've acquired. Uh, from Ayala Worldwide Academy. So, in my presentation, slide. Uh, with Somalia, uh, an East African country uh, with the longest coastline in Africa, uh, the maritime means a lot for Somalia, but with the past decades of civil strife, the maritime sector uh, has long remained unattended. And uh, for that reason, and, and the significance of Somali waters, and uh, the, the, the desire to really uh, incentivize the capacity of Somalia's Long, longest coastline in Africa and make the uh, flow of traffic services of, of, of maritime shipping. Uh, there was the need to revive the maritime sector and to do that, next slide. And to do that, the process, uh, the process of uh, recovery with the massive post-conflict reconstruction that is going on. The maritime sector is the at the heart of this process. Somalia's uh, reconstruction uh, really depends on, 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 on maritime industry because of its vast potential that the sector is associated with. Uh, through this, uh, it can be reflected from the increasing shipping activities uh, that recently has gained the momentum. And this has brought the safety concerns from, from the point of safety of navigation. So at the safety of navigation is at the heart of the shipping activities that has increased recently. And to counter this, the sector has long been, uh, has long been ineffective and the manpower needed to, to tackle the safety processes and, the, and, and where the world has really moved from the past couple of decades that we were laying behind. So to meet these demands and with the safety of navigation, manpower was really needed. And this gap was 
filled through capacity building. The capacity building was really needed. And this was met by, uh, next slide. Uh, through capacity buildings uh, provided by Ayala Worldwide Academy. And this has necessitated the process of acquiring and making effective the safety concerns and the safety and the meeting the SOLAS convention. So and 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 this was uh, this was uh, improved by acquiring uh, uh, knowledge and skill building through the successive trainings that we had. Personally, attending the 2019 Ayala Eighton Level One Manager was an eye opening to the advancements that the world has made through the safety of navigation and marine and towards marine aids to navigation. And this has taught me the importance of managing the aids to navigation and, and, and how the process and these advancements can help in improving the flow of traffic services and the safety of navigation. And by acquiring this knowledge and with the vision of Somalia's maritime industry, uh, this has meant that I could play a critical role in making Somalia's uh, maritime maritime services uh, one of the best in the coming years uh, and, and, a, and a regional player that, that makes use of it is maritime industry properly. Next slide. This is part of uh, uh, the, the, the pictures, uh, the trainings that we had. So far, three uh, certified uh, trained level one Aiton managers, Somalia, uh, and these three certified uh, trained uh, Aiton level one managers are really playing in a, 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 the most essential part of the current reviving uh, maritime sector. And, uh, and, and this was through the experience that we've acquired from the trainings and, 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 and hands-on experience that we've acquired from these high level trainings. Uh, by connecting with maritime leaders and, 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 and mariners uh, who share the same vision, who are really concerned of the maritime uh, safety and we're making the flow of mar uh, the maritime trade and maritime industry uh, work more efficiently. Connecting with them and acquiring the experiences directly from them was what I really needed towards advancing my career in maritime industry and, and towards anchoring the process of, of Somalia's recovery process. Next slide. Uh, this was immediately, the impact that we've acquired was immediately felt by reviving and restoring the, uh, the old Fort Sheck lighthouse, was, which was badly affected and, and damaged by the civil war, uh, the ramifications that it has gotten from the civil war. And uh, this lighthouse was a critical safety navigation uh, eight, uh, uh, an, eight, an essential eight ton uh, marking the entrance channel of Mogadishu Harbor. And to do this, uh, the Ministry of Ports, uh, with the knowledge that we've acquired in the process of making use of lighthouse projects and lighthouse uh, technical and with the projects associated with uh, restoring all lighthouses so combining our, our experiences with this urgent need, we have uh, uh, made immediate uh, uh, implementation of, of, of Fort Sheikh Lighthouse project. Next slide. Uh, the newly restored lighthouse uh, 
was completed. Uh, it was started from 2019 to 20, and within 2020, uh, hope for, with successive efforts, uh, the lighthouse was restored, and with the up-to-date modern technology and the lighthouse right now is really functioning fully functioning and it was the project was realized by during the inauguration when the acting prime minister acting prime minister his excellency Mahdi Mohamed Gulaid and and in the presence of uh, minister of ports uh, together they have officially inaugurated the Mogadishu lighthouse which has really as a junior uh, uh, serving the maritime sector of Somalia, I could really see that night uh, with uh, the master marinas, the captains who are really, who are from the past couple of days, uh, during, before, during the central government, who frequently used the, the mode, uh, uh, Mogadishu for, uh, for Tushek Lighthouse, I could see the emotions and the stories they were, they were having during the inauguration. And this has given me, uh, this has offered me the, the, the experience to appreciate uh, what the, the history of for Tushek Lighthouse together with uh, connecting with the current uh, restored lighthouse and with the experiences that and and, and 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 the stories that I heard from the uh, from the captains, this has shaped my thinking, and it has given me the understanding of the, the, the importance of Mogadishu uh, lighthouse and especially the safety of navigation of uh, Mogadishu port and the and how urgent. It is to secure the safety of navigation of Mogadishu, which is the capital city, and with the growing shipping activity along the Mogadishu coast, this has uh, shaped my understanding of, of what the work that we we, we really need uh, in terms of uh, exploring and, and restoring the other eight tons uh, to make one of the most comp regional competitors, uh, Mogadishu port, to make the Mogadishu port one of the uh, competitors of, of, of uh, regional competitors in terms of uh, port efficiency and, and, and supplies. Next slide. These are some of the pictures uh, of the current restored uh, with the up-to-date lantern. Uh, so, I would like to conclude my presentation with this uh, information and, and and remarking that the the trainings that we have we've had from uh, the Ayala Worldwide Academy uh, it has it has made us realize one of the milestones that the Ministry of uh, Ports and Marine Transport is aspiring and, in, and to realize its mandates through the efforts that we've made and making use of the knowledge that we've acquired. Thank you and happy World Eight and Day. Thank you very much, Somalia, for this very interesting testimony. Um, we will now turn to a video, to view a video from Northern Lighthouse Board in Scotland, showing the people at work using Atom. Here we go. <laughs>
Thank you, NLB, and especially thank you to Mike Bullock and Fiona Holmes for sharing this excellent video with us today. Um, now, um, China MSA kindly sent us a recorded video from Mr. Zhu Binxing presenting about um, AIDS navigation development in China since 2020, which we'll have the pleasure to see now. Distinguished Secretary General and colleagues from all over the world, it is my great honor to attend the WA2ND 2021 webinar and deliver my speech. In spite of the pandemic, I Ella and other colleagues from the AIDS to navigation field have working together to promote the marine AIDS to navigation. On behalf of China MSA, I would like to extend admiration and appreciation to the efforts and contributions from all of us made for the global navigation safety. Today, I would like to share some information on AIDS to navigation issues in China with all of you since 2020. Hope to strengthen cooperation with IELA and its members and to express our wishes for the bright future of our global AIDS navigation family and a more wonderful WA2ND all over the world. I summarized seven important events in light of the work of China MSA in AIDS navigation sector in the past two years despite the challenges brought by the pandemic. The continuous AIDS to navigation service. China MSA have taken multiple measures for the implementation of the provisions of AIDS to navigation to ensure the safety and efficient navigation even in the pandemic. These include strengthening the protection for AIDS to navigation personnel, enhancing anti-epidemic tests, use of telecommuting and drone survey for marine AIDS to navigation and interceptory. Strengthening international maritime cooperation to jointly combat the pandemic. The IMO recently issued circulator about guidance on the prevention and control of COVID-19 on board within five, combined by China MSA, to share Chinese experience in pandemic prevention and control on board with all member states, associated members, IGOs, and NGOs. This is the latest and fifth version submitted by China. Three, the latest development of e-navigation projects in China. All the pilot projects developed by China meet the related IELA guidelines. At present, they are in operation and keep improving. The VDS project has completed two shipboard tests for the stability of AIS, ASM, and VDE channels, communication distance, and single strength. Singles can be sent and received normally during the whole test. By June this year, there are more than 18,000 active users of e-navigation project in the Piro River Estuary of the Southern Sea area of China, with an average of more than 3,200 daily active users. Application of Beidou system in China maritime field. The transport industry is one of the largest civil users of Beidou system, and the Ministry of Transport regards 
BDS application as an important support for digital transport. China MSA has started the application of BDS equipment on official vessels and its certification. It is expected to achieve 100% coverage within this year. By the most advanced lighthouse tender was commissioned. Haishun 173, China's most advanced lighthouse tender, was commissioned in Guangzhou on July 22 last year, which can fully meet the demands of operation under complex sea conditions. The first large icebreaking lighthouse tender of China was launched on 15 April this year. Haishun 156, China's first large ice-breaking lighthouse tender, was launched at the Liu shipyard in Wuhan, and it is expected to be commissioned in September this year. It can break up to 0.6 meters ice with excellent ability for marine its navigation operation and ice conditions. The draft revision to China's maritime traffic safety law was adopted. On 29 April this year, the draft revision to China's maritime traffic safety law was adopted by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. This revised law strengthens maritime traffic management, maintains the out of the maritime traffic and ensures the safety of life and property. It also provides clear requirements on the development, operation, and management of marine aid certifications. It will come into force in this September. That's all for my speech today. I firmly believe that with our joint efforts, we will defeat the pandemic and the AIDS navigation family will have a bright future. Looking forward to meet you offline after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, China MSA, for sharing this with us. Um, we will now hear a live presentation from Captain Trevor Bailey from the Nautical Institute on its navigation a user's perspective. Captain, the floor is yours. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. I don't know whether you can see me. Uh, let's see if we can make technology work. And I will share my screen, I hope. I have no idea. I have no idea what's going on. But uh, can you well, can you see my screen? <laughs> May I just we we see the presentation, no problem. Yes, yes. yourself. Yes, sir. Let's carry on. OK, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to address this seminar, um, both in my role as a vice president of the Nautical Institute, and we'll come back to that a little later, if I may, but also as a serving shipmaster. I should point out that the views expressed in this presentation are my own, uh, developed over a long career at sea, and I've already learned some things this morning about Ayala, so thank you for that opportunity. I am grateful to Gillian Carson Jackson, who is president of the Nautical Institute, who I know is in the audience this morning or this evening for Gillian, and who is well known to many of you at Ayala. And I'm also grateful to David Petraco from the Institute, our director of projects, and he presented to you at your meeting in Seoul in 2018. I don't think I need to go on and clarify the difference between aids to navigation and navigation aids, but just to bear in mind that as technology continues to advance further, and we see the increasing adoption of ENAV systems and techniques, the mariner sees an overlap between the two systems. ATONs can now be presented on the screens of navigation aids. Well, I first 
went to sea. I joined the ship, 16,000 ton product carrier British Vigilance. I was 18 years old. I did not come from a seafaring family and I had little or no knowledge of the sea. And probably some people will tell you that even nearly 50 years later, nothing has changed. However, I quickly learned to enjoy my chosen career and I still do. At that time, the ship had no autopilot. The single radar was only switched on when in probable proximity to land and radio navigation aids were pretty much restricted to the Decker navigator system. Physical aids to navigation were much the same as they are today. Although lighthouses were still manned, radio direction finding was still in use and LEDs, what were they? In the early 90s, uh, the development of high speed craft led my then employer to conceive, build and operate what was at that time the world's largest high speed craft. It was the world's largest aluminium structure and it was the world's most powerful merchant ship. And they let me drive it. GPS satellite navigation systems were now well established. Differential systems were becoming commonplace and the introduction of electronic charts allowed for the installation of a very modern integrated bridge. Navigation of the vessel relied almost entirely on the electronic systems available to us. And we learned very quickly to adapt and adopt. Waypoint navigation became particularly important, but at the same time, we still needed physical atons as the points of reference for each of these waypoints. It is interesting to recall that notwithstanding the technology at our fingertips in our totally enclosed wheelhouse, the regulators had insisted and still do that there was a set of external microphones to detect the sound signals from other vessels and perhaps more significantly from atoms during restricted visibility. And I was reminded of this last night here at home when we were surrounded by thick fog. For the last 18 months, I've been working as the yard captain for Windstar Cruises in the Fincantieri shipyard in Palermo, Sicily. We have split three ships in half which is the background to my screen. We've inserted a new 25 meter section into each ship and put it all back together again, as well as installing new engines and generators and a host of improvements for guest experience. We've not had to make changes to the bridge equipment as this was pretty much up to date before the start of the project in line with SOLAS amendments to the use of ECDIS and so on. Two ships have already been delivered and the third will come back into service in October and I shall return to sea with that ship. So why do we need ATONs? From a practical navigator's point of view, I suggest that these four questions provide some insight into the acceptance of ATONs or indeed to the navigator's perception of whether or not they need to be there. They are, after all, aids to navigation. They do not take away from the need to navigate but they do assist in reinforcing the information available to the navigator and in increasing his levels of confidence in the safe prosecution of the voyage. We are taught early on in our careers at sea not to rely on a single source of information. The GPS can tell the modern navigator his position to within a few meters in some cases. But can he totally rely on that GPS position? Would it be wise to do so? If the navigator had a blank chart that showed only the topographical and hydrographic information, a plot of the GPS position would not necessarily indicate whether the ship was in a safe position. For example, is there enough water ahead? I have already referred to the phrase waypoint navigation. On ocean passages and in coastal waters, those waypoints may be relatively arbitrary. But as we approach our destination port, how will today's navigator select his waypoints for the port approach? Almost certainly this will be by reference to the charted information which will show the approach channels. And almost certainly these will be marked by buoys, beacons, sector lights and so on. And in many cases for large ports by reference to the VTS information available to the navigator. Historically, one of my early seamanship instructors had a favourite expression. Why do we do it this way? 
because Nelson did it this way. And indeed, when I first went to sea, many of the navigational practices seemed very old fashioned and outdated. Paper charts, chronometers, the sextant and the have assigned formula were everyday tools for the deep sea mariner. And it seemed to my rather naive eyes at that time that nearly every country had its own way of marking entrance channels with buoys and beacons of a variety of shapes, sizes, colors and characteristics. Some countries did it better than others. Of course, their physical presence was a great aid to the navigator in unfamiliar waters. The appearance of the lighted Ushant, for example, after a stormy poor visibility crossing of the Bay of Biscay was a welcome sight to many. It probably still is. With the advent of transit nav satellite navigation systems, there was great satisfaction in fixing the ship's position by a star sight and finding that this was very close to the position given by the latest satellite transit. Thereafter, of course, technology moved ahead at a rapid pace and GPS satellite navigation became the norm. From the plethora of many different systems of voyage around the world, the adoption of a common standard, the lateral system of voyage, was an enormous step forward to safer navigation in my view. And Ayala is still to be congratulated and applauded for this initiative and the continuing work that you do. Of course, local differences still exist, not least as to whether you are in either Ayala A or B regions. But I would suggest that these differences are less confusing than in my early years at sea. Hopefully the navigator can be assured that the buoys and beacons have been sighted after a careful and rigorous analysis of the navigational requirements for the area. And as our friends from Chile have just shown us and, and from NLB, we realize that that is the case. We also hope they've been well maintained. After all, a poorly maintained Aton one that has been damaged or covered in what I might politely call natural debris, may not provide the immediate indications of its significance to the mariner. So what about atons today? Do we still need them? Realistically, I strongly believe that there is a need and there will continue to be a need for the sensible and pragmatic mix of electronics and physical aids. This picture shows one of my recent commands passing my local lighthouse. Through a safe passage that is well defined by fixed and floating atons, as well as the islands on either side. The ship was equipped with the latest SOLAS compliant shipboard navigational equipment, including active and dual radars. But the physical presence of atons reinforced the psychology of a safe passage. And the views are amazing, particularly the wording on the lighthouse that tells the passing mariner no passage landward. So what do we need to do to continue to provide the optimum mix of atoms to maintain safe navigation? As I've already mentioned, the use of virtual electronic aids provides a significant addition to the armory of the lighthouse authorities to react to rapidly changing circumstances and the value of VTS cannot be overlooked. When VTS is operated in accordance with the IMO standards, clear, concise communication between ships and ports should ensure safe passage, both into and out of ports, and also through congested waterways, such as the Dover Strait or, say, the Bosphorus. For years, we have preached the gospel of look out of the window. The tendency for over-reliance on what is shown on a display screen in front of the officer of the watch can and does lead to accidents and incidents. But that is for another time and place. However good and accurate our electronic systems may be, there will be times when it is sensible to verify that information. And by looking out of the bridge window, the presence of that North Cardinal mark on the starboard bow, just as shown on ECDIS or the radar screen, can be very reassuring. Looking forward to the future, as we move slowly and cautiously towards autonomous ships, will there still be a need for physical atons? In my view, of course. Not all ships will become autonomous, 
not all ships will go to major hubs on major sea routes that may be monitored or, dare I say, controlled from ashore. We re rely as much on our coastal trading ships as we do on the ocean going beer moths and the men and women on board all of these ships will still need the comfort factor of buoys, beacons and lighthouses complemented by VTS to guide them safely in and out of port and safely to home. Ongoing developments for, developments for new buoys and beacons for virtual aids and incorporation to ENAV will require continuing cooperation and consultation between the developers, the providers and the end users. The Nautical Institute represents those end users and is actively involved in these discussions and we will be pleased to continue to be involved. From the survey that I mentioned earlier, my seagoing colleagues endorse the need for atoms of all types. Predominantly, mariners are happy with the level of service provided by physical aids to navigation. They welcome virtual aids, but primarily they are to complement the physical aids, not to replace them. We also have a number of concerns. For example, how do we ensure the physical conspicuity of atons? Can improved optical technology provide better assistance? In increasingly congested waterways, the radar conspicuity of ratons is very important. The use of ratons is a valuable asset, and we need to think about whether there are opportunities for their greater use. Land-based development is also an ongoing concern, particularly with reference to the volume and intensity of background shore lighting that may obscure essential ATONs. Virtual ATONs are another item of interest to the end user, but we see that they could be better used. For example, it should be possible to delineate a no-go area that they are intending to mark, rather than just having a symbol on the electronic chart, which needs to be further interrogated by the navigator. And the increasing integration of technology for chart displays has its own drawbacks. I've already referred to the need to verify the ship's position by external reference. And the development and adoption of the e Polaris concept may well prove to be beneficial in this regard. I do not consider the mix of ancient and modern to be a Luddite approach, even if some of my junior officers may see me that way. May I say I may not be wrong. And just a, a perspective on the Nautical Institute, it is the world's leading membership organisation representing those in control of seagoing craft, be that at sea or ashore. And I'm very proud to be a vice president of the Institute and to be able to represent our members at events such as today's. We're approaching the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Institute. So Ayala, you're older than we are. And we have come a long way in that time. We are an NGO at the IMO. The Institute has worked closely with IALA for many years in many fields, including the development, monitoring and improvement of the standards of training for VTS operatives. And we continue to do so. The Institute was a leading member in the development of ENAV through IALA. And our president chairs the VTS training working group. New members are always welcome. VTS operators with recognised training are welcome, as are ATON managers with appropriate qualifications and experience. We aim to speak with one voice on continuing improvements to navigation safety, as you do at IALA. Thank you for your time. I hope this has been of interest. Now I need to get back to this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you so much and thank you to the Nautical Institute as well. Thank you. Um, thanks. Oh, these were all so very interesting presentations and so relevant to our celebration today. Do you agree, Francis? Oh, yes, I agree. It was fascinating. That was really the Ayala family, Audrey. We from Chile, Somalia, China, uh, the Northern Lighthouse Board and our good friends in, uh, in the Nautical Institute 
that was really incredible, dynamic, mm -hmm. result oriented, and communicating just like the core values of I, I really enjoyed. Exactly, I agree. Perfect. Well, this is now time for our short break. So we will resume in uh, approximately five minutes. Give you five minutes. We will be um, playing a PowerPoint with the photos received uh, for this Watson Day. In the meantime, so enjoy, and we'll see you shortly in um, in a few minutes. <laughs>
super uh, annoying and in your way. No, no, of course I use them. Yeah, you use them? Yeah, of course I yeah. use them. You don't it's... only rely on the equipment on board? No, of course not. And you have good equipment on board? Yes, of course. Ah. Yes, I have these, 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 these electronic cards so you yeah. can see all the boys, but I, I prefer to... Look. And if you need to find your way to get to port... Then I have my cards, my maps. And I see all that red and, and green dots on your chart. What is that? And all that colors. What is that actually? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, the explanation is on front, of course. And you use the boys. They are not in the way when you're sailing. No, it's, no, it no, helps no. you. It yes. helps you. Yeah, well, these are Eastern I, navigation. I do not need this map, but I, 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 I like it. Welcome back for this uh, for this second part of the webinar. We will now have the pleasure to hear presentations about uh, Heritage Last Lighthouse with uh, Alberto Gavzana Jr. from Brazil, and then the Lighthouse of the Year from Sarah Jane Lachman from Australia. Now, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm grateful to Ayala and its Heritage Forum for this special opportunity to make some comments about Heritage Lighthouse. My presentation is a little long. That's why I recorded it to avoid technical problems in this slideshow. Delaying the schedule of the event, I will share it. Okay, is everybody singing? No, sir. N not yet. Uh. Well, I put it again. Yeah, please. Yes. No. Se ve como pero no en pantalla completa. We are. Yes, we see it. Uh, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing your presentation. It's not the the recorded one, then. Yes. May May you put it, Audrey, please? Uh, yes, we we can. Uh, yeah, I'm having a problem see. here. Yeah. No. No. No problem. Just a moment. Yes, it's okay. On a distant day, lost in the ocean of time, one our ancestor observed it was possible to move around in water, mounted on something floating. However, he desired to go beyond the horizon, decided to venture out, driven by multiple wants or needs, which continue to animate our spirits today. And what a fantastic adventure it has been since then. Returning to our inventive ancestor, he soon realized that to go beyond the horizon, it would be necessary something to guide him back home and family in safe. 
true. I assume he perhaps devised the first man-made aid to navigation in history. A simple pile of stones, a reference, the essence of all aids to navigation. On the curve of knowledge accumulated, I indicate some points referring the development of aids to navigation. Starting with what I call it the sense of aids to navigation, the pile of stones, the possibility of small columns with fire at top in the ancient city of Sidium, as mentioned by the poet Lesches, the pharos of Alexandria, La Torre de Hercules, built by Roman Empire in A Coruña, Spain, the oldest operating lighthouse in the world. Le Fave de Coudouin. In 1611, the oldest operating lighthouse in France, affectionately called as Le Versailles de la Mer, Le Fave des Rois, or even Le Roi des Fares. The first nominated Ayala Heritage Lighthouse of the Year in 2019. O Farol de Santo Antonio da Barra in the city of Salvador, Brazil in 1698. The floating aids to navigation from the second half of the 19th century. Cape Byron Lighthouse, in the most easterly point of mainland Australia, built at the turn of the 19th century. The first radio beacons, early last century. The Racons, after the Second World War. And in 1957, on July 1st, the establishment of Ayala. Happy birthday, Ayala, and congratulations to all Ayala team. Suddenly, everything starts happening very fast. Navsat, VTS, Ayala Maritime Voyage System, AIS, and here we are in navigation and all its complex structure. However, the end of this history is still far away, but despite the pandemic, it starts tomorrow, and the future of Atoms will be in the good hands of the International Organization for Marine Aids to Navigation, the new Ayala. Throughout this history, especially in recent centuries, experiences, specific knowledge, practices, and peculiar mores was being accumulated. It's developed its own customs, values, traditions, and symbolisms, forging a unique culture and creating the identity of a group committed to contribute to the safety of maritime navigation, usually sporting in its proud the image of a lighthouse tower in their uniforms. In Brazil, for example, when the lighthouse division was created in 1876, in imperial regime, the representative logo used a tower and still using today with minor changes. Several other aids to navigation services use a lighthouse tower embedded in their logos. This particular and rich culture is merged with another one, even broader and also very rich, which is the maritime culture, the seafarers heritage. Therefore, the culture related to aids to navigation, in which lighthouses are the greatest symbol, is not only revered by lighthouse keepers. It is also revered by all those who, by habit, pleasure, or necessity, walk on sea. What sailor coming from sea has never felt the relief, comfort, safety, and pleasure of seeing a lighthouse in a dark night? In the song of Brazilian hydrographers, the stanza dedicated to the aids to navigation asserts, if you take a bearing on the flash of a lighthouse showing you the way, you will know that it is our wish that you should never sail by yourself. The image of a lighthouse, however, transcends the boundaries of groups related to these monuments. The tower is intensively used in different sectors of human activities, intending to convey the idea of safety, solidarity, 
commitment, reference, light in the sense of wisdom, and many other positive abstractions that can be associated to lighthouses, as romance, adventure, etc. Nevertheless, how many of those use a lighthouse associated to their activities really know the purpose of the grid and complex structure of the modern network of marine aids to navigation and its influence in the daily life of all people, given that yes, more than 8% of world trade is carried out by sea. At this point, I would like to highlight the importance of the Heritage Lighthouses, particularly the Ayala Heritage Lighthouse of the Year. The lighthouse that could be considered as heritage due to its historical or architectural characteristics or any other particularity which may arouse interest, in many cases also may have an intrinsic capacity to promote to society in general the importance of marine aids to navigation in a broader context. Heritage lighthouses are more than just monuments. They are symbols. Too much they are symbols. They are a powerful advertising tools. In my view, in the case of a lighthouse already nominated Ayala Heritage Lighthouse of the Year, this intrinsic capacity gives it even greater responsibility as the lighthouse becomes a kind of Ayala ambassador, charged with the noble mission to spreading the message that, behind its own history, behind the magnificence of its tower or the flash of its light in the darkness, there is a large and complex structure dedicated to the safe economy and efficiency of navigation which implies the safeguarding of human life and goods at sea, as well as the protection of the environment, since any and all aids to navigation, however simple it can be, has always contributed to reduce the risks of accidents and the consequent dumping of polluting elements into the sea. Yet, more than this, contributes to trade exchange and, consequently, the development of nations. So, I glimpsed the three basic action lines to take advantage of heritage lighthouses. First, preserve them. Second, make them public and known in many different ways as possible. And third, use them to promote Atoms and its importance worldwide. The Brazilian lighthouse Santo Antonio da Barra nominated Ayala Heritage Lighthouse of the Year in 2020 is attractive due its historical and architectural characteristics, but also due its privileged location, which make it the best known postcard of Salvador and the focal point of most events held in the city that hosts more than 9 million national and international tourists per year. I'm sure Farol da Barra meet all the requirements to fulfill the task to promote the importance of aids to navigation in a much broader context. I dare assume Farol da Barra is one of the most photographed lighthouses in the world. Thanks everyone by your attention. Muito obrigado. I would like to leave some images for our future reflections. You're muted, Alberta. We can, we can see you, but we cannot hear. Well, my dear friends, in short, people like light, at least most of them. Lighthouses are elements that are part of the collective imagination associated with positive things. It remains for us to take advantage of this circumstance and use the, the heritage lighthouse 
to promote atoms and its importance, showing that lighthouses and lighthouse keeper, keepers are still alive, wearing different clothes, but imbued with the same spirit. Has said Câmara Cascudo, the Brazilian anthropologist, and I put it in my presentation, the sea doesn't keep traces of the kills that cross it. So, atoms and lighthouse keepers will continue to be essential for the safety of maritime navigation. And now, I have the pleasure of handing over to Sarah Jane Lexman of Australian Maritime Safety Authority to present the Ayala Heritage Lighthouse of 2021. Please, Sarah, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, Secretary General. Uh, my name is Sarah Jane and I am Heritage Coordinator for the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. And I want to thank you so much for inviting me along to present today. And I have a presentation, so bear with me for a moment while I set it up. Here we go. Alrighty, I hope you can all see that. Um, so AMSA is extremely proud that its most prized aids to navigation, Cape Byron Lighthouse, has been selected as Ayala's Heritage Lighthouse of the Year for 2021. We're very excited that the lighthouse's contribution to maritime safety has been recognised through this prestigious international award. And for the next little while, I would love to tell you about the lighthouse, its history, heritage significance, and also how we as the Maritime Authority of Australia strive to care for a tower that is both a celebrated historic landmark and a critical aid to navigation. So Cape Byron Lighthouse, if you haven't had the pleasure of seeing it firsthand, stands atop a rocky headland above the township of Byron Bay on Australia's most eastern cape. The light from its tower, the most powerful light in the country at over 2 million candela, sweeps over the bay um, below from dusk till dawn every night. But why was it built? So by the 1860s, shipping along Australia's southeast coast had um, exponentially increased due to frequent trade in the region. More ships, however, meant more shipwrecks, and Cape Byron was notorious for vessels being dragged across its rocky capes and losing valuable cargo. Slowly but surely, voices demanding the construction of a lighthouse grew louder, and by 1897, over 18,000 pounds in funds had been collected to put towards a lighthouse in the vicinity of the bay. Eventually, plans were in full swing, and a site on the Cape south of the bay had been chosen for the construction of a light station, which we can see here in the original blueprint plans. This cape was levelled in October of 1899, and the responsibility of designing a lighthouse fell to the New South Wales Public Works Department. Mr Charles Harding was the man tasked with finding a design to suit the needs of the headland. Having been a student under James Barnett, one of the most influential architects of the state, Harding had designed a number of lighthouses, including Point Perpendicular Lighthouse, Nora Head Lighthouse. And as you can see from the photos here, they do quite closely resemble Cape Byron. And they also resemble the similar Barnett style, which was rife in New South Wales in the late 1800s. So after reviewing the site, Harding set to work creating plans to a light station comprising of a tower, two keepers' cottages, storeroom, signal station and flagstaff. The circular tower, which in comparison to other Australia, uh, Australian lighthouses, were considered relatively short due to its 13 metre height from base to balcony floor. The towering headland was already 100 metres above sea level, so a tall lighthouse wasn't necessarily required. The keeper's cottages um, were designed in the Victorian Georgian style, a larger one for the head keeper and a slightly smaller cottage for the assistants. Construction commenced in 1900 by contractors Mitchell and King and was completed in 1901. Built on a mass concrete uh, foundation, the tower comprised of a precast concrete blocks fitted with a circular internal staircase and two intermediate floors, which you can see in the photos there. And a pavilion room was constructed at its base. But however, the crowning jewel of the entire build was the first order bivalve Henry Laporte Fresnel lens ordered from France. 
fitted atop a mercury bath pedestal. This was the only lens of its kind to be installed in an Australian lighthouse. With a diameter of two metres and weighing eight tonnes, the lens is comprised of 760 pieces of prismatic glass. The original light source was a concentric six-wick kerosene burner with an intensity of 145,000 candela. The lighthouse was officially opened by the Honourable John C., Premier of the State, on the 1st of December 1901, and this event saw the tower lit for the first time. Now, the lighting of Cape Byron was quite monumental as it marked the completion of the highway of lights along the New South Wales coastline, which with lighthouses that spanned all the way from Cape Byron in the north to Green Cape down in the south. Originally a manned lighthouse, keepers were stationed on site and worked on the station until 1989 after the lighthouse was converted to automatic operation. Over the course of its history, uh, Cape Byron has undergone very little change apart from the necessary technological alterations. And we are very proud to say that as of 2021, in its 120th year, Cape Byron operates via its original first order lens and mercury float pedestal. The tower is also still accompanied by its original keeper's cottages, flagstaff and signal station. As our most visited lighthouse, Cape Byron draws crowds for its historical themes, picturesque landscapes and cultural associations. The larger light station is managed by the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service and a tourist license is in place which allows general public to climb the internal stairs and see the lens rotating for themselves. Where once the kerosene was stored in the pavilion rooms at the base of the tower, a museum has taken its place where a number of AMSA artefacts are on display. The museum helps educate the visitors on the history of the lighthouse and also on aids to navigation through time. Most importantly, however, access to the light station site is free and available to all visitors. So due to its age, historic purpose, rare features and associations, Cape Byron Lighthouse is considered to have considerable heritage significance. In 2004, the lighthouse was added to the Commonwealth Heritage List, a statutory list compiled of sites deemed by the Australian government as integral to the country's historical landscape. A site must satisfy one of seven criterion to be placed on the list, and it was determined that Cape Byron met five of the seven criterion. First of all, for criterion A, it was deemed that the lighthouse was an important element in the establishment of navigational aids on the New South Wales coast and for its association with East Coast shipping since the beginning of the 20th century. For criterion B, rarity, the Henry Laporte optic, optic is the only one installed in a lighthouse in Australia. For criterion E, aesthetic value, the lighthouse is dramatically located on a windswept cliff and is a dominant landscape free of modern intrusions. Criterion F, technical achievement, the lighthouse is technically important for its early concrete block construction and for its use of the mercury float mechanism pedestal and the optic. And then for criterion G, social value, the place located at the most easterly point of the Australian mainland is visited by large numbers of people each year and has a high profile in the public imagination. It is also a key whale watching spot, just a fun little fact for you. So in 2019, the lighthouse was also added to the New South Wales Heritage Register. This register includes sites deemed by the state government as being integral to the local and state historical landscape and is quite similar to the Commonwealth Heritage List. And the Cape Byron Lighthouse met many of the criterion which are listed there, which I won't go through because it is very extensive. Cape Byron's heritage values listed on the Commonwealth list and the state register essentially guide AMPS on how to manage and operate the lighthouse appropriately. Our aim is to continue Cape Byron's use as an aid to navigation in the modern age without infringing on the heritage values identified. And I would like to show you an example of just how we manage this. So in 2020, a large scale project was planned for Cape Byron in order to rectify a number of issues in the lighthouse. Firstly, lead paint had been identified in the lantern room, and this was a substantial issue as the general public regularly accessed this on their tours and our maintenance contractors also accessed the room regularly. So the walls needed to be stripped of its paint and repainted, but this likely meant that we were removing the original paint layers um, from when the lighthouse was first built. So in order to retain a glimpse into the history of the walls, AMSA ensured that a small section of the paint layers were left on the wall of the lantern room, as you can see from the photo. And these layers are protected behind a perspex cover, which can be viewed by the general public for educational purposes. The second issue identified 
was the Mercury bath. It was observed that the bath pedestal was not rotating the lens as effortlessly as usual, and it was determined that a buildup of grit and dirt was amongst the um, mercury. So obviously this was a major issue as this could affect uh, the light's character. So as I noticed, as I mentioned before, a major heritage value was the mercury pedestal that's still in operation. So the idea of removing this bath and replacing it with a modern alternative, such as a roller pedestal, wasn't an option as this would have impacted the heritage values of the lighthouse immensely. So we ruled this out. This meant that the bath needed to be drained of mercury, uh, cleaned and then refilled. In order to do this without the use of modern equipment such as cranes, AMSA and its maintenance contractor undertook research and conducted on-site visits to determine how to operate the bath mechanism. And this was done by um, using the original cranking mechanism, which we can see in the photo here. Using this mechanism, the bath is lifted, the mercury was drained and the bath is cleaned and then the mercury was then returned. And I'm very glad to say that the lens now turns effortlessly inside the lantern house once more. So these are just two examples of how AMSA works to preserve as much of the heritage significance of the lighthouse as possible while maintaining a critical aid to navigation in the modern day. And we are so honoured to have been given the chance to share our lighthouse with you all on World Aid on Day 2021. The title of Lighthouse of the Year allows the tower's historical, architectural, technical and social significance to be truly celebrated on an international platform. And this is not just a win for Australia and Byron Bay, but for all lighthouses in Aton around the world. And so we'll continue to strive for good heritage management and conservation. Um, and we hope to see you all at Cape Byron once international travel resumes in the hopefully near future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these for these beautiful presentations and yes, uh, hopefully we'll be able to travel again soon and visit these beautiful places. We are really waiting for that. Uh, thank you. We will now turn to Japan for a presentation. Presentation. Rear Admiral Awai on the private sector support group for Lighthouse Service their activities and legal system for recognition. The floor is yours, um, Admiral Awai. Mm, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for us. It's my very much a privilege to be given a chance to share a piece of information with you regarding our recent uh, engagements for lighthouse management. Uh, first, I wish to congratulate everybody and my previous speakers for a very exciting, knowledgeable and uh, uh, interesting uh, presentations. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to add another piece of information to supplement your, uh, your another piece of information for the lighthouse management. In my uh, first uh, slide uh, shows the, our recent engagement, which we uh, have done. Uh, we have amended the law the, the Act of Lighthouse Management, no, the, the name is the Act on the Aids to Navigation, which provides the basic framework for managing the lighthouses of Japan. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, we have recently amended the law to enable the management of lighthouses in more efficiently and also to use the lighthouses for the purposes other than the aid and functions for the sake of local community. So I'll start from the background briefly, and then I'll move on to the uh, new legal system overview. Then I'll move on to the conclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let me start with the uh, background really briefly. So the we have more than 1,500 lighthouses across the country, including the National Heritage Lighthouses, and the Coast Guard is responsible for the overall management of those lighthouses. And of course, I share the view of my dear previous speaker that the fiscal lighthouses must be maintained for the sake of the navigation safety. 
but also in recent years, there is a growing need in the local community to use the large houses for the local events, tourism, promotion, etc. that those other than the, the agent basic functions. In order to cope with uh, these uh, trends, we have amended the law, the Act on AIDS to Navigation, last month to establish a new legal system to recognize the private sector volunteer groups for providing such services. So in the past, the, the works have already been done, mainly focusing on the cleaning of the large health environment by the large health funds. But after the amendment of law, they will be able to legally, they will be able to uh, conduct such services with legal background. And such the volunteer groups must be recognized based upon the amended law by the Coast Guard Commandant. So I'll move on to how the system works. So next slide, please. In the amended law, the volunteer, the private group, must be recognized by the Commandant of the GT of the Coast Guard based upon the certain criteria. And we are in the process of developing the detailed criteria for recognizing such services. And these groups will be called large health support group. And these groups will be authorized by law to conduct the following activities that are the servicing of minor maintenance for large houses. Because the, there are people who wish to these uh, services voluntarily. However, as the large houses belong to the Coast Guard and they are public properties or public infrastructure, they are not able to do it legally. So the new amended law will authorize uh, the volunteer groups to conduct such servicing, uh, servicing with legal background. And in order to promote the local tourism, tourism and so on, so they will be able to collect and archive the large house information and they will be provided to the, the local community also with this uh, legal background. And there are also people who wish to conduct scientific research on large houses and awareness promotion of knowledge on large houses and other related matters. They will, uh, also, they are all going to be uh, given the legal background for providing. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, these are the examples of the works conducted by or to be conducted by the volunteer groups. The from the left, the minor checkups like uh, painting or uh, minor repair. So as I said, these works have not been able to be done. They were only to be conducted by the Coast Guard because large houses are the public property. Even if the groups wish to do this, they were not able to do so. But after the law amendment, they will be able to do this legally. An open light house event. This has also been done on a limited basis, but uh, based upon the new legal system, the, those volunteer groups recognized by the Coast Guard will be able to conduct such open light house events with a legal background. And other things, also the nocturnal events, the light house side camping. I have seen the similar examples of the previous speakers' presentations, and I'm so encouraged to learn that many other light house keepers are having the same mind. And in order to touch upon the light house structures for minor checkup checkups, for example, so the Coast Guard must give authorization to do so, but the formality for providing the uh, the authorization, or in other words, permission, can be very, very simply given by the Coast Guard based upon the newly established procedure by the amended law. And we are now in the process of developing the detailed formality for such a permission procedure. And the recognition criteria, so this will be established by the uh, 1st of November, which is the date of entry into force of the amended law. Uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, this slide shows the other examples that we have followed when we established the new system for large houses. There are many similar activities and legal frameworks for the other types of uh, public infrastructures like roads, rivers, ports, and coasts. And there are volunteer local community groups wishing to contribute to the local community by cleaning, the planting, and the other activities to the uh, local community, and also using the public infrastructure for the local events like the cafe or a bench installation, environment the conservation programs. So these things, apart from the original purposes, they are now being widely used for the local com promotion purposes. And we are going to do the same for large houses. Next slide, please. So this has been done already. This slide shows that the present status of the uh, number of volunteer groups that already provide cleaning services for the lighthouse environment. So there are many, mainly focusing on the uh, heritage lighthouses. There are the famous local communities at uh, many different places of the country providing cleaning services of lighthouses. But after the law amendment, they are going to be able to provide more extensive services for the lighthouses, not only the cleaning, but they will be given a chance to use large houses for the, the more extensive purposes for the tourism promotion and local events and etc. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows the other examples of the local events uh, done by the local volunteer groups. Not the cleaning, but the Awareness rising of large house history education, the information correction, and the tourism promotion by large houses. So there are many different types of events used by the done by the local community by utilizing large houses for those purposes. And after the law amendment, so they are going to be able to provide the more extensive the events for large houses based upon the new legal framework. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the new system will enable the local community, the volunteer groups, upon recognition by the Coast Guard Commandant, they are going to uh, conduct the many different types of the lighthouse related, uh, related the events based upon the legal framework provided by the amended law. And the Coast Guard will work closely with these local communities, so they will more will be able to more efficiently maintain the lighthouses to the full, and the local community will so much benefit from the new legal system. Thank you very much. The next slide, please. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Japan, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will now see the last presentation of the day with uh, Captain Milan Todorov on the VTS Center and the plans for next year in Bulgaria. Captain Todorov, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening to everyone who is uh, attending uh, in this uh, uh, wonderful event. Uh, I want to give my congratulations to all those uh, who are uh, professionally uh, connected uh, with the provision of aids to navigation and uh, the, the safety of maritime traffic uh, in general. Uh, so uh, today what I'm going to present uh, is going to be in the light of the uh, planned uh, future event uh, for the next year, uh, 1st of July 2022, uh, when uh, we are planning, uh, let's hope that uh, uh, it uh, will uh, happen that way, we are planning to, to make the event uh, presently in the port of Burgas uh, in Bulgaria. 
Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, give uh, some more information to put some more light on uh, the, what you're going to, to find uh, in Bulgaria, if we have the opportunity to do that uh, this way. And uh, because uh, Bulgaria has been a member of the IALA for about 10 years already, uh, I want to give some more information about uh, uh, how uh, aids to navigation and vessel traffic services are being uh, provided uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, so I'm going to uh, try to share uh, my presentation now. Uh, are you able uh, to, to, to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Not in uh, So. Yeah, <laughs> so about uh, Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria is situated on the southeastern uh, part of uh, Europe. Okay. Uh, in the we, don't, we don't see the, the, we see the end of the presentation actually. Excuse me. Mm. I have to go to the first slide. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't seem there to be in presentation mode. And then presentation mode. Okay, then it's available now. Try to do it again. I'll share the entire screen. And now, is it okay now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, so uh, Bulgaria uh, is uh, situated on the southeastern uh, part of Europe, in the center of the Balkan Peninsula, and. Uh, it is uh, on one of the uh, trading routes uh, which are uh, gaining uh, bigger importance in uh, the last years and we hope uh, that uh, in the years to come the, the importance of uh, this route and the uh, development our, of our ports uh, will uh, face uh, better perspective. Uh, and uh, so the, the main ports uh, in Bulgaria uh, are uh, Port Varna and uh, Port Burgas on the seaside. And we have two main uh, trading ports on the Danube River, uh, Port Ruse and uh, Port Lom. And with some uh, secondary uh, terminals and ports uh, as well. Uh, Port of Burgas is situated uh, on the southern uh, coastline of the, the Black Sea. Uh, it is on the, the western coast of the Black Sea, the southern Bulgarian coastline. Uh, this is uh, the port with uh, the biggest uh, important importance for um, liquid cargoes and uh, it has a uh, uh, bigger volume of cargo in general. Uh, the water area uh, contains of uh, three main basins and uh, port for liquid cargoes, well-developed port for big tankers up to uh, 250,000 uh, dead weight. Uh, port of Varna is uh, on the northern uh, coast of Bulgaria. Uh, it's uh, in the uh, in Varna Bay. Uh, it's uh, mainly uh, for general cargoes, uh, containers, and uh, production from the industry uh, which is uh, situated around uh, the lake of Varna. Uh, so the port uh, water area uh, of Varna uh, is uh, uh, in, it's, uh, separated in two main ports, uh, Port Varna East, Port Varna West, which are connected with two lakes and a uh, channel of uh, about uh, 14 uh, nautical miles. Uh, which is uh, all along uh, uh, provided with uh, aids to navigation. Uh, in Varna, we have uh, more than 100 uh, floating uh, aids uh, to navigation uh, and uh, about uh, 60 uh, floating uh, aids to navigation in, in Burgas, uh, excluding the lighthouses and, uh, of course, uh, the vessel traffic services as an aid to navigation itself. 
so uh, the company uh, I'm uh, representing uh, uh, is uh, the managing body of, uh, of all the Bulgarian ports. Uh, and uh, some of the main activity uh, in, with connection with this role, uh, our company is building the, the ports and the terminals. Uh, we are uh, maintaining uh, the existing uh, approach channels and uh, uh, infrastructure for access of, uh, of all the ports. Uh, securing the navigation safety in the territorial sea uh, by providing the vessel traffic services in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, our company acts, uh, as a matter of fact, as a landlord uh, of uh, all ports, uh, according to Bulgarian legislation, uh, the, the ports and the approaches uh, the, you know, to the port. So, so that's uh, one of the main roles for our company. Uh, we have uh, on the seaside, uh, we have uh, three uh, main branches for our company. Uh, these are the two uh, branches uh, uh, which are uh, providing uh, the infrastructure and the uh, aids to navigation and the, the vessel traffic services authority. Uh, is operating, it's, it's not operating, uh, it's uh, providing uh, maintenance of the infrastructure of uh, several uh, terminals. These are uh, the main terminal, port uh, terminal Burgas East 1 and Burgas East 2. Uh, there is a port terminal Burgas West, uh, which is uh, mainly for containers and uh, some uh, bulk cargoes. Uh, port terminal Rosinets, you can see on the bottom left, uh, is uh, the liquid cargo terminal where the big uh, tankers uh, are able to, to come alongside. And we have uh, a port terminal in the Seber, which is uh, mainly a passenger uh, terminal. In Varna, we also have uh, several terminals. Uh, the, the two main terminals, port Varna East and uh, port Varna West uh, for general and uh, bulk uh, cargoes and uh, in Port Varna West, uh, also well-developed container terminal. Uh, uh, port uh, terminal petrol is uh, also for, for tankers, but for smaller tankers. Uh, and uh, we have uh, terminals in, in the Lake of Varna. Uh, this is uh, the, the less port terminal and the uh, Ezero power plant uh, terminal. Uh, the, we have a particular uh, ferry terminal, which is for railway ferries. Uh, we had uh, well-developed railway ferry lines uh, across the Black Sea in the past. It is still functioning. And uh, the, the, the importance of, uh, of this uh, line and these terminals uh, uh, have decreased during the past years, but now uh, it seems that uh, there is a bigger interest uh, towards uh, uh, railway ferries in our area. And uh, Terminal Bolchik uh, on the bottom uh, right, which is mainly for uh, bulk cargo. Uh, it's uh, a separate port so situated a bit, a bit north of uh, Varna. Uh, uh, so uh, we are uh, providing the aids to navigation and uh, uh, some of the lighthouses, the, the approach, the port approach lighthouses. Uh, you can see uh, the base, uh, land base for maintenance of uh, the floating uh, ACE to navigation, some of them situated in the channels. And uh, here on the bottom left uh, is the approach lighthouse of uh, Port Varna in the middle. Uh, is uh, the lighthouse uh, in port of Burgas, and uh, the bottom right uh, is uh, an entrance, uh, small lighthouse from for entrance. Uh, in this uh, case, we have uh, uh, the, the right-handed, uh, the, the green uh, lighthouse in Burgas. And uh, the, the third uh, uh, directorate, which is uh, situated on the seaside, uh, is the Vessel Traffic Services Authority as uh, part uh, of the uh, aids to navigation. Uh, so uh, our authority uh, 
uh, is uh, centralized. Uh, we uh, are managing uh, the vessel traffic services uh, on the whole coastline of uh, the Black Sea, the, the two main ports. Uh, we are uh, monitoring and managing the, the ship traffic, uh, collecting information. Or we are also providing the GMDSS uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on behalf of Bulgaria. So here you can see uh, one workplace of a VTS operator. Uh, here, this is, this is the one in the center in Varna, one of the workplaces. Uh, the structure of the system of the vessel traffic services, uh, we have a centralized main core, uh, which uh, provides information for the operators in the two uh, main centers uh, situated in uh, Port Varna and uh, Port Burgas. These are uh, mirror sites. Uh, you can see on the left uh, on, the, on the chart. Uh, the, the two buildings, uh, they have uh, been built with the same uh, uh, structural design, so they provide uh, uh, almost the same uh, services. Uh, the only main difference is that in Varna is situated uh, the uh, Global Maritime Distance and Safety System Center, and uh, in the two centers we have the vessel traffic services, uh, north and uh, southern sector. Uh, we have an integrated uh, core with the software which uh, provides uh, data to the operators from uh, AIS. Uh, we are running the, the national AIS server. Uh, we have uh, uh, distantly remote controlled uh, VHF uh, for connection with uh, vessels all along the coastline. Uh, we have uh, TV cameras, uh, meteorological sensors radio direction finders and of course uh, uh, on radars uh, which allow the operators to uh, also to provide navigational assistance as uh, navigational sensors we have all navigational sensors uh, so the the operators in the two centers are qualified to provide all the the specter of uh, services in, in vessel traffic services uh, the information service uh, organization of uh, vessel traffic in approaches in, in the ports and the navigational assistance service. Uh, so uh, we are uh, we have started we uh, we uh, are building an integrated information environment uh, for all the vessel traffic, which includes not only the vessel traffic services. Uh, information and uh, assistance uh, but we are also providing the maritime single window uh, the port management system for organizing the port movements uh, we are providing uh, connections with data for the safety net and we are now developing a more public system the port community uh, which is uh, to, to be connected uh, within this uh, uh, integrated environment uh, so that uh, all data uh, is able to to reach its uh, users uh, flawlessly it's a long process uh, as i've mentioned uh, we are providing also the, the gmdss uh, service uh, we have several uh, sites uh, with uh, radio equipment we are providing uh, the NAFTEX uh, on behalf of Bulgaria and uh, Romania in the area Juliet. Um, we are providing uh, the all coverage of the GMDCS in area A1 and A2 uh, and uh, some uh, communications uh, with uh, vessels uh, uh, over lower frequencies which is still being uh, uh, held as, as a function of, of our centers. Uh, for the future <laughs> development, uh, as uh, Captain uh, Bailey mentioned before me, uh, we are uh, implementing the use of uh, virtual and synthetic aids to navigation. Uh, we are studying the opportunities this technology uh, gifts and of course uh, we are studying the opportunities to develop uh, this technology 
uh, in the area of uh, wider uh, widening the channels uh, with additional informations uh, uh, such as uh, prohibited areas or dangers. Uh, so uh, we have uh, already started to, to provide uh, uh, virtu virtual and synthetic aids to navigation. And uh, of course, we are implementing uh, the artificial intelligence technologies in our uh, systems. Uh, we are um, experimenting uh, with uh, cloud uh, structures where a big uh, amount of data is being processed in order to uh, to be able to to provide uh, to to uh, provide decisions to the operators uh, in real time and uh, uh, we are planning to develop uh, a bigger project during the the next few years in in this area as well uh, so what are our goals uh, of course uh, our uh, company uh, aims uh, the the safety of navigation and protection of the human life at sea in general and uh, improvement of the opportunities for environmental protection uh, as uh, i've mentioned uh, we are trying to uh, develop an integrated uh, information environment uh, improving the business to government dialogue uh, in the maritime sector uh, and uh, improve the the process the competitiveness uh, of the ports and uh, the the improve the processes in the maritime sector uh, in general uh, so at the end uh, i'm uh, going to uh, show some pictures from uh, our uh, sea cities uh, in the two the two main ports uh, with with the hope that we will be able to really organize presently the event uh, during the next year uh, now uh, you are seeing uh, port of burgas uh, the uh, public area uh, where on the on the right you can see the vessel traffic uh, services uh, center uh, in the middle is the passenger terminal and here on the left uh, is uh, the uh, the newly built uh, congress center which uh, all the three uh, have been built by our company and here in this uh, center we are hoping uh, to be able to organize the event uh, during the the next year uh, we have a bird view of uh, the city of Burgas and uh, uh, a picture of, uh, of the central part. Uh, here is uh, Varna. Uh, this is the central part of Varna and uh, bird view uh, of, of on the city. Uh, you can see uh, the main approach channel. Uh, in the top uh, of the picture is the Varna East uh, terminal. And uh, uh, here is uh, in the bottom the approach channel to, to the Lake of Varna and to the inner terminals. Uh, even you, here you can uh, uh, see if <laughs> you focus uh, uh, some of the aids to navigation situated in the, uh, uh, in the approach channel. And uh, these are a few pictures. Uh, 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 on the top, I believe that is from the last tall ship uh, regatta, which was held in Varna. Uh, bottom right, you can see the Asparuhov bridge, uh, uh, which goes uh, over the, the approach channel between Varna East and Lake of Varna. And uh, uh, some views of uh, the navigational tugboat services uh, in our port. Uh, so thank you very much and hope that uh, we'll be able uh, to, to see you in our country and in our uh, port uh, during the last year uh, presently. Thank you so much, Bulgaria. Uh, we really look forward to next year's event as well. Thank you. Um,
We are now approaching the end of this uh, special webinar, and uh, so we will now hear the closing remarks from uh, Omar Fritz Eriksson, Dean of the Worldwide Academy and Deputy Secretary General. Omar. Thank you, thank you, Audrey. <clears throat> I can only say, what a journey. Today we have traveled the world and um, heard testimonies and stories from practically every corner of the globe. We have heard from Chile, Somalia, Scotland, China, Brazil, Australia, Japan and Bulgaria. Not to mention, uh, not to forget, uh, Captain Trevor Bailey from the Nautical Institute representing all the seafarers of the world basically, who are indeed uh, the real end users of the uh, globally harmonized marine aster navigation system we are all all working so hard to achieve having watched and listened carefully to all these interventions i am uh, once again amazed at the range and complexity of challenges our members are facing around the world it reminds us of the importance of the work that we are doing, providing guidance to the world on all sorts of matters within our domain. Ranging from engineering guidance through operational and managerial guidance to guidance on how to preserve. And Please, please unmute. Mario, unmute Sorry. Uh, I am. I am very sorry to hear that at this stage. I've been talking for five minutes now. No, 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 it's okay. Just the last minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 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 Uh, I will. I will. Uh, I will carry on from. Uh, our mission is a noble one ensuring efficiency and safety of life at sea while protecting the marine environment. And uh, we have learned today that uh, it is widely supported and uh, as far as I can see, we're well, well on the way to achieve our, our vision. Traveling around the world, be it physically or virtually, uh, we at the Ayala Worldwide Academy are uh, detecting real progress out there. We, uh, we see how marine aster navigation, buoys and beacons and lighthouses and vessel traffic systems, and in fact, all sorts of aster navigation services are con constantly being progressed and improved. But even more importantly, uh, we are seeing a change in attitude uh, and how decision makers are becoming more and more aware of the, the international obligations of uh, coastal states around the world in terms of marine aster navigation. So this is this is an achievement of all of you out there, Ayala members and alumni of the Academy, acting as ambassadors for Ayala and our common vision. I must thank all of you, both speakers and participants, more than more than a hundred of you, for being here, joining us in the celebration of the World Marine Aster Navigation Day. I sincerely hope that uh, the coming year will be significantly different in terms of opportunities to meet physically and uh, enjoy each other's company, exchanging interesting stories and jokes, etc. as people usually do from time to time in families such as the Ayala, truly international family. See you soon again and remember to keep your distance for a while still. Over to you again, Audrey, and uh, thank you and, and your team for preparing this wonderful event so well for us. Thank you, Omar. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be virtually with you all today. So thank you everyone for participating to this wonderful event and making it wonderful. Please keep on sharing and celebrating and sharing your photos of it on, on social media as well. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.
Goodbye all.